Hello everyone, I'm Vicki Healy at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar co-hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the Global Women's Network for the Clean Energy Transition. Today's webinar will focus on the topic of women's empowerment and best practices for the sustainable energy sector. Uh, before uh, we begin the presentations, I'll go over some of the webinar features and provide an overview of the Solutions Center uh, and we'll also hear a little bit about GWNet. We are extremely fortunate today in that we have Ambassador Irene Geiner Reichel from the Austrian Diplomatic Service delivering what I know will be a terrific presentation. And then following uh, her presentation, we will have a question and answer session moderated by Irina Kalbinger. Um, I'd like to make uh, attendees aware that uh, upon ending this uh, webinar today, you will see a short survey pop up on your screen. And we thank you uh, in advance for taking the time to answer a few questions about your impressions of this webinar. Uh, a few things to know before we begin. For audio, you have two options. You may listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio box. And if you want to dial in by phone, select the telephone option and a box on the right side of your screen will display the telephone number and audio pin. Uh, a gentle reminder to our panelists and moderator to please mute your audio when you are not presenting. Uh, to illustrate the features I just uh, uh, mentioned a bit more clearly, we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. So you should see something that looks like this in the upper right corner of your screen. Um, questions, we will have a question and answer session and you can submit your text questions to the presenter by typing your question into the questions panel. And then you can send your questions at any time. Um, Irina and I will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. So today's event is being recorded. If you would like to review the webinar or share this information with others, an audio recording will soon be posted to the Solution Center's YouTube channel. And also, you will receive an email within the next day or so with a link to access this webinar recording. So a little bit about the Clean Energy Solution Center. Uh, the Clean Energy Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Solution Center is structured to help governments design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. And this help is provided through an Ask an Expert Technical Assistance Service, which is offered to governments free of charge and is designed to allow experts to respond quickly to questions. The Solution Center also engages in capacity building activities, such as this webinar you are attending today. And with that, I'd like to toss things over to um, our friend uh, Irina at GWNet to speak a little bit about uh, GWNet activities. Thank you so much, Wiki. So GWNet aims to advance the global energy transition by empowering women in energy along our three pillars through interdisciplinary networking, advocacy, mentoring and coaching. We seek to address the current gender imbalances in the energy sector and to promote gender sensitive action around the energy transition worldwide. Now let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Irene Gina Reichel has been a member of the Austrian Diplomatic Service since 1982. Her main area of expertise is economic and social development, women's rights, environment, energy, and development cooperation. Among numerous leading positions, she was also Director General for Austria's Development Policy and Cooperation between 2005 and 2012. Since July 2017, she has served as the Austrian Ambassador to Brazil and Suriname. Irene is the President of the Global Forum on Sustainable Energy, Vice President of REN21, founder and current vice president of the Austrian National Committee for UN Women and founding member and president of GWNet. As mentioned, I am Irina Gaubinger, project manager at GWNet 
and responsible for implementing various projects in close collaboration with our executive director, Christine Linz. I will be your moderator today during the Q&A session. And without any further delay, we will now begin the presentation of our freshly released study, Women for Sustainable Energy, Strategies to Foster Women's Talent for Transformational Change. This study has been supported by the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Um, so a huge thank you to the Ministry. And now, once the presentation has started, I would like to hand over to our presenter, Irene. Thank you very much, um, Irina, for the introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. It's a, a, a great pleasure to do this webinar um, together with the Clean Energy Solution Center. And um, I think we can advance in uh, the slides um, already to the next one. Uh, Irina has already given us a brief overview about the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. You see the summary and a few snapshots of what we are doing on uh, the current slide. If we go directly then to um, the study that we are going to present today, that I'm going to present today, Women for Sustainable Energy Strategies to Foster Women's Talent for Transformational Change, which is on the next slide, uh, we can uh, see uh, the various elements of input that we used to produce this study. We had a, um, a very uh, distinguished authoring team uh, consisting of Anna Boyd, Anne Marie Nobelius, and Sarah Stenz, a very international team. And uh, they um, uh, proposed this uh, fourfold uh, approach for the study, uh, which would consist of the review of scientific evidence, um, industry reviews, analysis of um, uh, the, the data that we have, and recommendations. And the key question that we wanted to address um, in this study is a very simple one. What can we do to increase women's employment in the sustainable energy sector in the future? Now, why uh, would we ask such a question? Um, I think many of you who are working in sustainable energy uh, will say, well, that's evident because there are not enough women in the sustainable energy sector currently um, active. And um, uh, that really is a shame for any number of reasons. Um, and we will go into these reasons um, in, in, in a moment. Uh, and exactly that was, was, was also our starting point to, um, to depart from the uh, knowledge, not so much underpinned by data, but by our intuitive knowledge that there simply are not uh, enough women uh, active in sustainable energy. And that this is really to the detriment of uh, the full enjoyment of human rights of women, because women are entitled to participate in all activities in society um, and economic life, etc., as they choose, but that it is also to the detriment of the energy transitions, which, as we know, are not advancing fast enough and are not scaled up rapidly enough in order to deliver what they need to deliver uh, in terms of climate change policies, sustainable development, um, overcoming poverty uh, worldwide, including energy poverty, etc. So if we look to the next slide, we can have um, uh, a quick impression of um, uh, the situation. If we are uh, basing ourselves on the analysis, the best available analysis so far that Irina 
the International Renewable Energy um, uh, Agency is putting out there are roughly about 11 million jobs worldwide um, in the year 2018 in sustainable energy in the widest sense of the word. And we expect those jobs to grow by the year 2050 to probably 42 million um, or so, or even more. Um, it is, of course, important that women get a chance to participate in this growing sector. And it is necessary that they get a chance on an equal footing with men to participate in this sector. As I said before, this is a question of human rights for women, but it is also a question of social uh, justice, uh, of economic development, of ecological um, solutions that are better found if women participate fully in, um, in, this, in this important activity. Now, if you look at the figures also on these slides, uh, we see that the underrepresentation of women is really quite, um, quite severe. Uh, board of executives uh, in utilities, about 5% women. Um, conventional energy, 22%, renewables, 32%, renewables in the STEM uh, uh, disciplines, 28% uh, women participation. So, uh, very, very a uh, clear uh, fact that that women do not participate fully in this sector and um, uh, uh, this is uh, where our our starting uh, point uh, for the study is now the next slide also shows that uh, it is quite difficult to have um, good um, data uh, there are really no harmonized data sets yet, and many of the studies uh, that we can draw on um, are not comparable, strictly speaking, because they use different methodologies, because data sets are too limited, because definitions even of what is included and what is not included when we talk about um, sustainable energy vary. Uh, greatly. So um, you see on this slide just um, how how much the, the figures really um, uh, differ. Uh, what we can say as a conclusion from these differing uh, figures and from the fact that we don't have harmonized data sets, however, is that women are severely underrepresented and uh, that there is a need also to collect better data and that the data really need to be um, disaggregated more systematically according to gender and other criteria. Now, if we go to the next slide, you will see uh, many uh, figures which perhaps you cannot read so clearly on the screen, but you will see them in the full study. We are very happy that the study is already available and on the last slide you will see the link where you can actually um, uh, find the whole study and all the um, supporting evidence to my presentation. Uh, but you can see from uh, the graphs of this uh, slide very clearly that uh, women in other industries um, also don't fare so well and uh, our study at least could not find any global evidence that one sector does much better than others. Um, but there are in all the sectors, uh, subsectors or companies uh, that um, actually do better. And, um, and, and this is what we focusing on um, in, in some major parts of the study. And I will talk about that in a little while. What I would like to highlight for this slide also is that there is one 
a very um, strong commonality across uh, practically all of these sectors that um, our study authors have um, uh, glanced at, and that is women's leadership decreases with seniority in the company in all sectors. So at the entrance level, often uh, the, the percentage of, um, of women is not so bad. If you take, for example, uh, the insurance sector, you have 60% at the entrance level, but only 17% make it up to the C um, uh, suites. Or if you look at healthcare, which has, you know, very high, traditionally very high um, uh, women uh, participation in the entry levels, when you get to the to the true leadership levels in the companies, uh, in the institutions, you are uh, again down at a, a 33 percent. So there is something um, something systemic about underrepresentation of um, of uh, women in many sectors. Of course, it is very obvious uh, when you look at the oil and gas sector, 28 at the entry level. 28% uh, at the C-suite level, 10%. Um, C-suite uh, refers to CEOs, uh, CFOs, uh, you know, of, of, of corporations. Many of these data um, are uh, taken from McKinsey, as you can see from the source, and obviously they focus more on corporate settings. This is also a limitation of our study that um, uh, the focus is a lot on corporate settings, while, of course, we at the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition are very aware of the fact that uh, sustainable energy um, comes in many forms and um, economic um, and legal um, identities, and uh, that the corporate uh, system is not uh, the, the only one to look at and, and may even uh, not be the most uh, significant one when we look at uh, the situation in many developing countries where the access to energy uh, is, is, is the challenge um, at hand. Anyway, uh, this is um, uh, showing how women are currently doing in a lot of areas, including in some of the energy-related areas. If we go to the next slide, uh, we will uh, see that there is also a, a very uh, important body of evidence that gender equality is actually very good for business. Uh, it is not just an issue of human rights, uh, which I emphasized in my initial remarks. It is, an, it is an issue of human rights, and that's very important. Women have the right to have access to employment on equal terms with men. But it is also uh, very important uh, for the global economy, for the economy of countries, and it is very good for the bottom line of companies. Uh, there are uh, calculations by uh, various organizations who say that if we uh, were reaching gender equality by 2025, uh, the amount of 28 trillion US dollars would be added to the global GDP. And the amount of 12 trillion uh, US dollars per year would be added if each country in a region, in a given region, reached the level of gender equality of the best country in that particular region. So very significant sums. The World Bank has done studies uh, years ago already showing how um, uh, gender equality is good for economic development of countries, how it is good for social development purposes. So uh, there are very um, convincing data to show that gender equality is good. At the corporate level, um, uh, many uh, studies have shown that 
uh, companies that have diverse leadership, including women in the leadership, are better prepared to survive financial shocks, may have a higher profits, um, are doing better in terms of innovation, R&D and use of talents. Uh, women tend to be less overconfident and therefore their companies uh, run a decreased risk. Uh, women in the boards and in the leadership of companies have been demonstrated to be more active on environmental issues um, and so forth. So there are many uh, uh, good studies and a lot of evidence that shows that including women in your workforce at all levels across uh, uh, your organization is actually very good. So then why are there not more women included? And if you go to the next uh, slide, please, we will see, um, uh, you know, some uh, uh, interesting pictures. Uh, why can't a woman be more like a man? I think you all know the, the famous song from the, from the musical My Fair Lady. Well, uh, because women are women and men are men. Uh, the, the illustration on top of the slide, the girl's brick set, is, is a good um, example for how uh, gender perceptions obtained at childhood uh, can be very per pervasive throughout people's lives and throughout organizations' uh, uh, lives. This girl's brick set, you could say, well, it's wonderful. It's a brick set. Uh, brick sets used to be for boys, only, but this is a, a girl's brick set. But again, you see even in that, in that example of the brick set, how a, send a, a, a particular view of what the role of women is in life, in society, etc., is um, transported. And I think that's, that, that's part of the challenge that we are confronting when we are trying to increase women's participation in sustainable energy, just as we confront that same gender stereotype uh, when uh, we look at other sectors. Business is historically a masculine culture. There is pervasive belief that men are better leaders, even, th e even though we have lots of evidence by now that uh, women actually do better on many leadership qualities uh, in many tests than their male uh, peers. Uh, there are negative perceptions about women's abilities, which also tend to kill uh, the confidence of women who are already engaged in sustainable energy, etc. And this cultural bias is very often explained as natural, and that's why it is also referred to as an unconscious bias. It's not uh, quite, uh, it's not quite clear to people that they are even acting out of this bias, and therefore it is very hard to address the bias and to redress the situation. Now, um, why is this so important, this whole issue of uh, increasing women's participation in sustainable energy in the context of the energy transition? If we look to the energy transition concept, you know, we have to remind ourselves that uh, it's not just about switching fuels. It's not just about, okay, here you have a diesel generator and you replace it and you put a renewable um, energy uh, thing there. I don't know, wind or, or, or photovoltaic or, or something along these lines. Of course, that's part and parcel of the energy transition. But the energy transition will be uh, much more radical than that if it is to deliver uh, the, the, the ecological results, the climate change results that we all need. And uh, it goes beyond replacing fossil uh, fuel um, by clean uh, sources. It will require changes in consumption, distribution and investment patterns. It will uh, 
require new coalitions and capabilities of actors, new socio-technological regimes of policy, regulation, mindsets, belief and social practices. It requires behavioral change, innovation and integration across sectors. And therefore, it requires diverse backgrounds, capabilities and perspectives and a large and diverse talent pool. And um, if we turn to the next slide, this also came out um, uh, from the interviews that uh, the authors of uh, the study uh, uh, made. If you, if you recall uh, one of the initial slides, you know, the study draws on assessment of available scientific data, but then um, the study authors also did interviews with um, uh, some uh, 34 uh, people, mostly women, a few men were included that are in the um, active in the sustainable energy field. And obviously this is not a sample that allows for any statistical conclusions, but it gives um, Uh, some examples of the perceptions that people have that are already working in, um, in sustainable energy. So one of the themes that came up and that harkens back to what I said um, about unconscious bias is that people in the sector, women and men alike, have little awareness um, or understanding of the gender dimension of the workplace dynamics. Uh, gender studies is, is of course a very uh, important and by now very established field, but it's a specialized discipline in many ways. And it's not obvious that any woman or any man working in any field would be aware of the gender uh, dimensions. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of uh, making that gender Uh, uh, dimension visible and understandable in uh, various uh, work um, uh, contexts. Traditional gender roles prevail, was reported by the, by the interviewees. There is masculine dominance. If women work in the field, extra expectation, extra expectation is put on women. Women have to work extra hard. Um, policy, practice and implementation uh, vary a lot. Uh, flexible and working environments, which would be valued very highly by women and probably also by many men, um, are not uh, sufficiently present. But at the same time, uh, uh, the interviewees also noted that there is Uh, generational change is happening and uh, and that uh, the uh, uh, sustainable energy field presents opportunities uh, because of the fact that it is a young sector and because of um, uh, uh, the fact that it is a sector that requires very broad sets of skills and we're going to to come to that in a minute. So uh, we are going to flip through the next slides um, relatively quickly. I'll just um, let you read uh, the, the, the quotes from the women. If we can go to the next slide, uh, there is little understanding of gender. Uh, there were traditional gender roles which prevail. Generational uh, change is happening. And there are quite a few differences across subsectors, uh, which is also um, interesting to note if, because uh, as in so many situations, it doesn't help um, to uh, think of one solution that fits all. Um, situations, working situations, challenges and so forth are quite different and it is important to um, look closely 
as a, 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 at the real reality at hand. So the study found, for example, that there is uh, some difference between decentralized, smaller off-grid rural projects and centralized, larger projects in terms of the challenges for equal participation of women and men in those, in those sectors. So if we go to the next um, slide, uh, we start uh, looking at uh, the strategies for inclusion. And that um, was, um, uh, that is, uh, in my view, really the heart of the study. Um, a lot of what I said so far, and a lot of what uh, you would be reading if you read the chapters one to four in, in the study, are very interesting uh, descriptions of what the situation currently is. But the driving force for our study, of course, was we want to change the reality that now exists. We want to bring in more women um, into sustainable energy. We want to make it possible for women who work already in sustainable energy to thrive and to overcome any obstacles that they might face. So what we did in chapter five, uh, we looked at the various strategies for inclusion that are already being um, uh, used by companies, by governments, by international institutions, um, uh, by networks to uh, make the sustainable energy sector more inclusive. And I should say, when we, when we use the term inclusion in this study, we think about uh, women in the first instance, but we don't, um, we don't limit our thinking to uh, equality between women and men in this context. We would like to, to take um, the term inclusion in uh, the, the broad sense uh, inclusion of diversity, of all kinds of diversity, diversity of skills, diversity of experience, diversity of backgrounds, of race, of language, of ethnicity, of um, uh, gender definitions that people um, choose for themselves, etc. So the, the chapter five is very rich and it gives you examples for um, uh, all of these strategies. And these strategies reach from quotas. Quotas, of course, are controversial. And uh, the literature uh, discusses them in, in, in a controversial uh, fashion. But there are also very good examples uh, for how quotas can work and where uh, quotas um, uh, can um, can be useful. Uh, of course, it's about attracting more women and girls to STEM. It is um, it is about um, uh, bringing women in levels of senior decision making roles, of increasing transparency and accountability, of using existing resources and toolkits, and um, supporting coalitions of the women. Very important is um, the, the whole issue of overcoming bias when it comes to recruiting and uh, to have strategies in place in the workplace. You know, you have to have inclusive job descriptions. The, the selection panels have to be um, inclusive. You cannot just have selection panels with only men. And, and this carries over into the inclusive workplace strategies. And all these um, um, strategies, as I said, have been demonstrated by um, uh, companies, by governments, by institutions, by NGOs. The following um, slide shows, um, sums up uh, the opportunity for the sustainable energy sector. 
the opportunity that the study offers, the interviewees, we at the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition see uh, for sustainable energy. Um, and it is quite interesting, I think, to, to uh, dwell on this for a moment. Sustainable energy is a young sector, so it has relatively few bad habits to overcome. And that also allows uh, sustainable energy to do something about including women um, in a better uh, way as in the past in all parts of the workforce. Sustainable energy is green and value driven and has a reputation of that. There are studies that show that women um, are quite open to these uh, new values of sustainability um, and perhaps uh, sometimes more um, uh, attuned to them than their male colleagues. Um, and then there is the element that energy transitions require all the talent they can get. Business worldwide must make the best use of all available talent. So, if we have so much evidence in the literature and in the lived reality of companies, institutions and governments and so forth, that diversity is good for economic development, for social development, for environmental development, how can we not do whatever we can to include women as um, uh, on an equal footing with men in, in, in the sustainable energy sector, which, you know, uh, arguably will be the sector that drives uh, the, the movement towards greater sustainability. And sustainability is the only option that we have, um, at least in our view, um, uh, for our, our, our globe and for humanity on our globe to live in peace and in, 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 in well-being uh, with each other. So sustainable energy can open up avenues towards inclusive business practices and can show the way for less inclusive sectors. As I said before, the energy transition in our view is really a process of societal transformation. So sustainable energy can show the way how societies can become more um, inclusive and thereby also more sustainable. If we go to uh, the next slide, we will already be in the area of the recommendations. And the recommendations of the book really um, uh, pull together everything that we have learned from the analysis of the scientific uh, studies that are available from the interviewees and from looking at the very, very many case studies and best practice examples from industry, from governments, from institutions that already um, uh, practice inclusivity and uh, make it possible for uh, the workforce to become much more diverse and much more inclusive. So we have um, um, different uh, portions of recommendations in the study. And uh, um, on the slide, you see um, the recommendations, uh, the, the big headings of the recommendations for how to support women that are already engaged in sustainable energy. Uh, the next slide gives you the, the headlines, basically, of uh, the recommendations as to how the sustainable energy sector as a whole can become more inclusive. And then the study um, uh, concludes with a few recommendations, uh, a word to, uh, we call it in the study, in the study, a word to individuals, a, a word to you and me, to all of us here. What can we do? Because obviously we all can do things to make things better. And um, on this slide that you have before you now, uh, there are a few ideas of what each one of us can do 
we can avoid gender stereotyping and attempt to challenge implicit bias wherever it occurs. We can be very careful in our day-to-day -day interactions about language use, decisions made, and so forth. And if we are in a managerial position, we can support and promote competent individuals and aim for diversity. We also have a word to companies and organizations. There, it's very important that the commitment is really uh, strong and visible and, um, and checked also at, uh, from the top down. Uh, it's important to have strategies in place. These strategies need to have indicators and uh, the implementation of the strategies need to be monitored against the targets that are set. There are many tools available already. It's not necessary to always reinvent the wheel. So it's important to use what is already out there and strengthen um, employee-led initiatives also. Coalitions of the willing, very important, uh, because change always encounters resistance. So those that are willing to change should help each other and uh, it will become easier to, to whittle down the resistance. Pipeline development, working with edu educational institutions obviously is very important. So then we have a, a word to educational institutions at the next slide. And uh, I let you um, uh, read uh, the text. It starts out with the data question. Remember how I said initially that we really don't have uh, very reliable data. So it's important to improve on that level. Of course, we have a word to governments, which is on the next slide. Governments are responsible for setting the legislation. Uh, governments and parliaments, of course, are, are responsible for setting the legislation, for uh, putting in the standards that cannot um, uh, be neglected. Um, and they have many opportunities to leverage the energy transition to increase uh, diversity and inclusion. If I'm trying to sum up uh, what uh, this study is doing, then I think there are a few takeaways and I would like to leave you with these. Um, sustainable energy is a growing area, it's a young area, and it needs and seeks diverse talent with a broad range of skills. So this presents a real chain, a real chance. Many actors in the field have already implemented a wide variety of strategies to increase women participation in diversity in general. And the study gives you ample evidence of these examples and uh, gives you um, uh, sites and quotations to find out more about individual examples if you are interested. Diversity, my, the third takeaway, has been proven to be good for the economic bottom line. And I think our study also makes quite a convincing point that it is also good for social development and ecological objectives. And finally, since energy transitions are deep societal transformations, um, the equal participation of women and men is absolutely crucial and will be the only way we believe that the scaling up and the acceleration that is so much needed will happen. Now, the good thing is that there are many women's networks already um, in existence and the listing uh, here on the screen and the listing also in the study is um, uh, neither ranked nor weighted. It's just an example of what is out there already. So the encouragement to you 
um, to look for uh, suitable networks in your area, to link up with other women who wish to um, change the situation and uh, to encourage each other to do so. You can find um, uh, more information about um, the Global Women's Network in the uh, online. We have the Women in Energy Expert platform. I would encourage you to, uh, to register on that platform if you haven't done so yet. It's a, it's a great tool. Almost 1,000 women have already uh, registered, so there is no more argument that there are no good women out there. There are lots of them and more and more are registering. And you can find the study also available at um, uh, the link that is listed on the last uh, slide. Um, if we could advance to that last slide, please. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for, for this opportunity to share the, this, this presentation of our study with you all. And uh, again, to thank uh, Vicky Healy from the Clean Energy Solutions Network and Irina um, to, for, for, for her work on the study in general, but also for her uh, work with me um, for the presentation of this study uh, just now. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, for the excellent presentation. We have some great questions coming up and submitted by our audience. And we'll begin now with the question and answer session. So let me start by one question that was posed by Annie Healy, um, asking West Africa or ECOWAS validated a directive for national regulations to assure gender assessments are included in energy projects. Do you see the pros and cons of implementing such regulations? Yes, I see. Um, I think that's a very important um, uh, question. And uh, the example from the ECOWAS region is, is an excellent um, example. Um, uh, in the ECOWAS region, uh, there is a, a center, the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in um, headquartered in Praia in Cap Verde. And um, uh, as it so happens, I was involved in setting up uh, this center, which I think is um, instrumental for elaborating exactly that directive that um, uh, you, you have mentioned in your question. I think it is, it, it is very important to have such directives. I think it's very important that regional governments um, like the governments of the ECOWAS region, you know, the West African region, work together on these issues. Uh, these are questions that can best be addressed uh, through regional cooperation, because also the markets are regional. And um, I think they make a big difference. When I was Director General for Austria's Development Cooperation, we made sure to have these um, um, gender uh, uh, criteria included in all the projects and programs that we had, and we, we made sure that they were implemented. And it does make a difference. Thank you, Irene. I have another question here from Nadia Chiuk. She asks whether you think that the quotas approach is appropriate when we talk about inclusion. I think it depends. Um, on situations, but I think there are many situations where it is appropriate, and um, there are there are good there are good examples uh, from countries. For example, I mean Rwanda is is an example. You know, they set a quota for um, elections uh, for for female candidates at at, at elections, and um, the quota once the quota was set, it was constantly over reached. So the quotas are also a signal. Quotas make it possible for women to become visible in situations where um, they have not been visible in the past. And that in itself triggers change and encourages women um, to, to go for something for which they are absolutely qualified, but 
where the 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 traditional view perhaps might have denied them the qualification. So I think quotas can work, have been demonstrated to work. They are not the solution to everything, but they should also not be disregarded as a tool. Okay, thank you, Irene. I would like to also uh, take into account Davina and Gay's question asking, what is the role of women's networks in promoting gender inclusion in the sector? And do you have examples of some existing networks? And maybe Vicky, you could draw up, draw up again the slides with the with the women networks we have included in our presentation, so that people can take a more detailed look at them. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Davina, for this question. Um, I think women's networks are very important for very uh, many reasons. One, because you know, we all know when we talk about uh, situations in business, but all uh, also in politics, we all have heard the expression, oh, well, it's an old boys club, it's an old boys network, you know. So that refers to the networks um, our male colleagues have uh, established and are using successfully. And so simply to... Uh, to to use uh, the successful example of those uh, networks is already uh, a good uh, reason for women to, to form networks as well. Networks are excellent ways to encourage each other, excellent ways to share information with each other um, uh, when it comes uh, to job openings, you know, women can um, can advance each other in that context. Uh, so I, I do believe that they are um, very good for the members of the network. But networks are also good lobby instruments. They can lobby governments, they can lobby institutions, um, industry associations, uh, you know, you name it, and, um, and, and find ways for um, uh, advancing the interests of their members. It's easier for a network to do that than for an individual a woman working in sustainable energy. Um, and as you can see from the list, there are many um, women's networks already in existence, some uh, with a more regional or national um, uh, focus, some um, with a more sectoral approach, etc. So um, it's, it's, it's a good thing, I think, to, to connect into um, these networks that are suitable for, for you and, and find out um, how you can use them best. Okay, I have another question here from Esmeralda Sindhu, and she gives a bit of context before, so I'm going to read that to you. Mm -hmm. um, she says, Women will only be considered as much as their inputs are acknowledged. In history, the inputs have often disappeared, or men have been acknowledged for women's discoveries, for example, DNA. Today, women's inputs are still often claimed by men, also in donor-funded projects. For example, the name is not acknowledged on the author's list, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And women often discover this after the fact and then have limited recourse. Um, managers do not seem to care or often do not uh, rectify the situation appropriately. Um, you can see that easily with written inputs, but with more softer inputs or spoken inputs, I guess, um, it is dif more difficult to, to identify. And it is often experienced by women with less than 10 years of work experience, preventing them to level up and be acknowledged in the sector. Now, Irene, do you have any practical measures in mind that could be implemented to counter this practice? No, first of all, I would like to say that I think the analysis is absolutely correct and it, it is pervasive. You know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's the same in government. It's the same in my field where, uh, you know, which is a, ma a very male dominated field, also diplomacy, you know, perhaps uh, 10 to 15 percent of the ambassadors um, are, are female currently. So a very low representation of women in this field as well. And it, it, the only concrete, um, you know, suggestion that I can make is 
uh, is when you see something like that happening, um, don't swallow it, don't uh, gloss over it, but but protest, you know, in in polite fashion, in 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 proper form, of course, but don't accept it because it is very pervasive. You know, I I, I remember countless sessions uh, of um, I don't know meetings, uh, uh, various various configurations of meetings where uh, women were cut off uh, when they were starting to speak with the with the argument, oh, well, we don't have so much time anymore. Can you please be short? Before that, you know, men went on to, to at great lengths to speak about whatever they felt was necessary. When a woman takes the floor, she doesn't even get the equal amount of time. So that needs to be resisted. When women come to meeting rooms, they don't find a space at the at the meeting table. They have to sit in the second row, where whereas you know may, male colleagues take up all the space. So it's about this happens all the time. It happens everywhere, and it's not even always intentional by the male colleagues. Often it's not intentional. It's just the way they are used to do things. They don't even uh, pay attention to it. So women have to claim each step of the way they have to claim their space they have to claim the time to speak uh, they have to uh, claim uh, the 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 place at the table uh, etc unfortunately i don't think there is any other recipe and uh, when you are in a managerial position you have uh, to, to make sure you should be making sure that clear etiquette you know protocol basically is put in place to acknowledge uh, equally the input of of women and and men to to give equal space uh, for presentations to to put women on panels to put them on in, in selection committees in awards committees all all these things it's there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done unfortunately but it can be done and it has been demonstrated that it is done successfully thank you irene um i would like to pose a follow-up question by esmeralda on a different topic because i think it is important she's uh, uh referring to the zero tolerance policies on sexual harassment and looks at you know the gap of policies that are often fine on paper but lack enforcement or implementation um so for example in a male-dominated environment she states sexist remarks uh, conveyed in front of colleagues still make most colleagues or men laugh and this leaves the door open to worse practices so now she her question is how can we make each of one each one of us feel responsible to rise and speak up against these practices practices could this systematic gender awareness training to all organizations be made compulsory and how do we make sure that enforcement mechanisms exist so that a woman who speaks up doesn't face retaliation so yeah. the first question was how can we make uh, each one of us feel responsible to rise and speak up yeah well um, uh, I think these, the, 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 the discrimination against women uh, and other uh, forms of discrimination uh, is, is very gradual. You know, it, it starts with very, uh, very simple things like, as you said, uh, jokes or, or, you know, teasing or uh, things like that. And, but, but it's really, um, uh, incrementally rising up to to uh, more severe forms of discrimination and therefore it's very important to to halt um, um, uh, even the the so-called mild forms of of sexual uh, discrimination I, I i give you a, a simple example from my life you know i had a male colleague who was uh, more senior than i was and whenever he uh, met me whenever we encountered each other in, in, in the beginning of a, a professional meeting or something like that, he would always comment on my dress. Now, I, I dress nicely, but I don't, you know, put uh, a lot of effort in my dress. And the first time I saw, well, that's nice, he makes a compliment. The second time I thought, that's weird. 
the third time I thought, well, that's really weird because I realized that he was, that was, he was seeing me as, you know, a woman and therefore I need to be dressed nicely. So he, he says something, nice. he, he was trying to be nice actually. So the, the fourth time I met with him, the first thing I said is, oh my, Victor, you have such a great tie, wonderful. And he stopped short. He never made a comment again about my dress. And when we had an interaction, we had an interaction that was professional. You know, I, so uh, these kinds of things, I think we have to, uh, in, in, in gentle ways, I think we have to retaliate. And, and we cannot laugh at sexist jokes. And we have to say, I'm sorry, but this is really a sexist joke. And uh, well, how do you prevent retaliation to happen to a woman who stands up against a sexist joke? That's very hard to say. Um, I think the best uh, short-term uh, measure is for women to stand up with each other, you know, so not let one woman uh, do, do it alone, but the others back her up. And then I'm sure soon there will be um, an intelligent and, and a fair male who also joins and, and, uh, and, and, and the, jo the jokes will cease eventually. But in an organization, of course, there should be, um, depending on the size of the organization, there should be um, entities where you can make an anonymous complaint, where, you, where due process can happen in investigations of, of these sorts. But I'm very aware of the fact that all this is uh, very idealistic and that in reality um, things uh, don't happen uh, like this uh, 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 very often. I think gender, gender sensitivity training is a good thing. I, I'm always a bit um, uh, hesitant uh, when it uh, comes to making too many things mandatory. But I think gender sensitivity training, for example, should be offered um, in, in, in the context of managerial advancement uh, courses and programs, absolutely. But women should also take that uh, gender sensitivity training for themselves. You know, there are many forms of trainings that can help women to be uh, more uh, certain about their rights, to know how to um, to ask for what their rights are. Um, they can become more affirmative. They can be, be become better speakers in public, etc. So I think that's a very good thing for women also to do themselves to strengthen themselves in their uh, capacities and in their skills as well. I mean, it's a very broad topic. One could talk for for hours about it, but I don't think we have uh, the leisure to do this here. Exactly, Irene. Thank you for sharing the example and 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 also um, to for the answer on the second question, which I think is very insightful. There are two more questions that I think I would like to take up, if that is okay. Um, yes. One is by Ngagun Daloka Sita if I pronounce it that correctly. She wishes to know if there are organizations that organize and promote women, women talents and skills uh, development, I guess. So sometimes women are interested but lack the necessary tool and skills and therefore that is the participation. Yes, there are many organizations who do that. Um, you know, there, there, there are many... Um, uh, I don't know from which country is 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 the um, is is uh, does the question come? Do you know Irina? I have to ask. Let's see, Ngagum, can you write that in in the chat, please? Yeah. So in many in many in many um, uh, cooperation programs, uh, for example, uh, uh, that the European Union does with uh, partner countries in Africa or Latin America or the Caribbean or that uh, bilateral donors do, there are, um, uh, often there are components that have to do with women empowerment in, in these programs and, and projects. And uh, there are 
Uh, there are many NGOs that offer uh, these kinds of programs and, and the financing of the NGOs, you know, comes from diverse sources, often also um, from, uh, from foundations and, and so forth. So I, I, I would encourage um, uh, to, to look in the local context where these, these kinds of uh, skills are, um, uh, skills training are offered and, and uh, uh, take it from there. Um, I think, um, you know, we hear it at the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, we hear it often that um, a more, um, how shall we say, uh, comprehensive training um, that we could offer would also be perhaps a, a very interesting thing uh, that could then be diffused electronically through means like this webinar or interactive sessions, things like that. And of course, we have, as the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, we also have the mentoring programs where we match mentees from, from sustainable energy uh, with more senior women um, and uh, they work together for a year um, uh, in this mentoring relationship. And that, I think, also can open up many opportunities, uh, both in the conversations between mentee and mentor, but also uh, through suggestions that the, 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 the mentor may make in a more tailor-made fashion to, uh, to point a, a specific mentee into a direction of... Uh, skills development, capacity building, etc. Mm, thank you, Irene. Now to the last question. Davina and Gay is asking, how can we begin to tackle our own unconscious bias regarding women's abilities to be successful leaders? Well, I think that's uh, uh, really uh, done very well uh, through joining networks and through doing really uh, programs uh, of self-development, you know, because unconscious bias is exactly that. It is unconscious. So it's it's not an, by an act of the will that you can stop doing behavior that is nourished by this unconscious bias. It's it's not by an act of the will that you can change your way of looking at the world that has been uh, ingrained in you, you know, through the social customs in which you grew up, through the, the, the gender stereotyping that you have experienced in your society, in your family, in your school, etc. So there's a, there's, there is some real work of uh, psychological development needed and of social emancipation as well and the two have to go together so it's it's great to do this in groups but I think it's good also once one has recognized the need to work on this area to do it in a professional setting okay thank you Irene I think that was our last question for today and I would like to hand over to Vicky. Great, thanks so much, Irene and Irina. Um, you know, an excellent moderation, and and Irene, your presentation was just outstanding. And of course, thank you to our audience for your great questions. And uh, you know, again, once again, a, a hearty thank you to our panelists. Uh, before we adjourn. Um, I'd like to welcome Irina and Irene to offer any final remarks or thoughts they may have. Um, uh, Irene, I'll start with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. No, only to say it's really a privilege to be in contact with so many women across the world through these uh, means of, of modern technology. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, wonderful to know that there are so many women out there who are interested in these questions and who are uh, really uh, walking the talk wherever they are. And I would simply like to send a, a message of encouragement. Um, believe in yourself, continue to do what you're doing. You are excellent women and you can do it and you are needed to change the world and the world needs to be changed. Thank you. 
Very well said. I love that final remark. Uh, Irina, any thoughts from you? Well, I would just like to thank you, Vicky, for co-hosting this uh, excellent webinar. Um, um, it's been a great pleasure and I would just uh, like to encourage all the women out there to sign up to uh, on our platform as uh, Irene has already said earlier um, and also check out the other offers on the Global Women uh, uh, GW Nets uh, website. Um, I'm sure you'll find something that is in for you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much to you. Um, and again, uh, before we go, I'd like to as mentioned, I send a very hearty thank you to to our, you know, to Irene and Irina and also to our attendees. You know, we very we know how busy life is and how many how much work we all have to do. So we are very much appreciative of your time and your participation. And we hope you found that today's webinar um, was valuable and you're taking away some good information that is helpful to you in both your, you know, your professional and your personal lives. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, a, um, you will receive an email tomorrow uh, with a link to the recording of this webinar and also I'll include a link to the study within that email so that you'll have access to that easily, both of those things. Um, and a quick reminder that uh, once the webinar ends, a short survey will pop up after, uh, you know, the conclusion and again we appreciate your taking a few minutes to answer just some very short survey questions that are very important to us. So with that, I send you all good wishes and this concludes our webinar. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you so much.